Hill walking is extremely common in toddlers as they learn to walk. In fact, some studies quote up to 5% of toddlers will toe walk. But if they toe walk after two years old, you should talk to your pediatrician about other potential causes of toe walking. Yesterday, we talked about the case of a seven-year-old boy who was brought to my office for evaluation of toe walking and other complaints. Developmentally, he's developed pretty normally, but he's had trouble with recurrent urinary tract infections. Mom also states that he intermittently complains of back pain and pain down his legs, but she attributed them to growing pains. On physical examination, he had normal strength and normal sensation, but I noticed this tuft of hair on his lower back. These are all signs of spina bifida with tethered cord syndrome. October is spina bifida awareness month and I want to talk about this condition that can sometimes be missed. It's a condition that can be diagnosed in newborns all the way well into adulthood. And the symptoms can vary on presentation depending on which age the patient is in. Well, what exactly is it? Most of us know that our spinal cord sits inside of the spinal canal. That's a space inside of our spine that protects all of the nerves. If we talk about the anatomy of our neurological system, we have our brain that's connected to the spinal cord that floats all the way down inside of the spinal canal. Wait, it floats? Our brain and our spinal cord are surrounded by spinal fluid for protection. It kind of does float. And at every level of our spine, we have a nerve that exits and goes to various parts of our body. Nerves in our neck go down our arms and supply our grip strength. Nerves in the thoracic spine go to our ribs to supply muscles that allow us to breathe. And nerves in our lower back go into our legs that allows us to walk. What most of you don't know is that the spinal cord actually ends around T12. So below that area of our spine, there is no more spinal cord and instead it transitions into various different nerves that are called the cauda equina, AKA the horse's tail. And all nerves in the cauda equina branch off and go to various parts of our body, including all the nerves that go into our legs like the sciatic nerve. One piece of tissue that is really important for the spinal cord, and that's called the phylum terminale, or this little piece of tissue that anchors the spinal cord to the bottom of our spine way down here. So as we grow taller from infants to adults, the spine also grows with us. And if there's unnecessary traction on that phylum terminale, the spinal cord can get tethered or become too taut. Here is a picture that explains just that. So you can see where the spinal cord ends a little bit lower, and that's because there's too much tension on the cord itself. And too much tension on the spinal cord can cause a lot of different symptoms. In kids in this age range, it can cause all the symptoms that I mentioned. I know there may be a few parents out there that are watching this video that have kids that toe walk, so I don't want you to be too concerned. The most common cause is habitual toe walking or they just got used to it and it can run in families. But there are certain medical conditions that are associated with toe walking that should be ruled out including tethered cord syndrome. And many of you guys in the comment section also mentioned autism. Now toe walking itself is not a sign of autism, but kids with autism often do toe walk. In fact, one study showed that 41% of kids with neuropsychiatric disorders do toe walk. Because the spinal cord can't rise properly if it's tethered, it often manifests in back pain and pain radiating down the legs. That's because those nerves are under unnecessary traction. I mentioned recurrent urinary tract infections and it can also cause chronic constipation and incontinence or bedwetting. Those lower sacral nerves that supply the bowel and bladder can also be affected or damaged by tethered cord. What about this hairy patch? There is a spectrum of presentations of spina bifida ranging from very minor to severe with the spine that can even be exposed at birth. I've done a video in the past explaining all these different types of conditions. In the first month of pregnancy is when the spinal cord and all the nerves are formed. If there's failure of any part of that development, you can get various forms of spina bifida. That can range from spina bifida occulta, where some of the bone just doesn't form quite right, to myelomeningocele, where the entire spinal cord can actually be exposed in the baby at birth. Any of these conditions can be associated with tethered cord. Patients with this minor abnormality in development, also known as spina bifida occulta, can present with a hairy patch over their skin. That can be a sign to a doctor that this may be present. 
That's why physical examination and looking at the patient is extremely important in making these diagnoses. This is our patient's MRI, so let me explain it. Where did I tell you guys that we typically see the spinal cord end? T12. So if you look at this MRI, it appears that the spinal cord ends right around here, which is L4. That's too low. Here's what an MRI of the lumbar spine should look like, and we see that the tip of the spinal cord is right here, and all of these things right down through here are the cauda equina. So we can tell by looking at that MRI that the spinal cord is under too much tension and did not rise as the child developed. So once it's diagnosed, what's the treatment? Well, you probably guessed it. We can go in surgically and cut the phylum terminale to allow the spinal cord to rise up. If it's identified and treated early enough, a lot of the symptoms are completely reversible. The one thing about children that's markedly different from adults is that they can heal and recover from surgery very well, including surgery on the nerves. Neuroplasticity in kids is pretty amazing. If this is left untreated, the symptoms can progress well into adulthood and sometimes can be irreversible. And some of these symptoms in adults are so subtle that they get missed throughout their entire life until they culminate well into adulthood. The one thing about surgery for tethered cord is that you can even get re-scarring of the cord after the surgery and that can happen in 10 to 20% of the time. As you can imagine, retethering and reoperating on cases like this can be quite challenging. After surgery, rehabilitation is very important, including physical therapy and occupational therapy. In our patient's case, he underwent a successful tethered cord release, and within just a few months, all of the symptoms improved. After six months, he's a completely normal kid. If you have a child with some of these symptoms, make sure to talk to your doctor. Another case of patient-focused and compassionate care. I hope you guys learned something on this case. Stay tuned next week, and I'll go through another case.